It's been more than a month since the failed mutiny in Russia by the Wagner Group leader Yevgeny Prigozhin. And questions still swirl about Putin's grip on power. Did the failed mutiny weaken Putin or make him even stronger? To answer that key question and more, I'm joined by the exiled Russian journalist Mikhail Zigar. He was the founding editor-in-chief of the Russian news channel TV Rain. He also has a new book out, War and Punishment. Putin, Zelensky, and the path to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Mikhail, pleasure to have you on. Thank you. First, this question we're all trying to understand. Has this mutiny weakened Putin? And the, the reason I think many of us wonder and think maybe it did is he isn't punishing Prigozhin. He hasn't punished much of the Wagner group. He needs them in some way or he feels he can't act. In the, it seems that for a guy who likes revenge, this seems odd. Yeah, but even more, uh, he used to be considered a person who is in control, who, uh, who controls all the elite, all his inner circle, and who is the guarantor of, the, of peace, and the only guarantor of peace and stability. And now, for many people, inside his own bureaucracy, it's clear that the emperor is naked. He, he cannot guarantee anything. He cannot control even his... Uh, his puppet, because everyone knows that Prigozhin used to be his puppet for so many years. And, uh, and yes, he's, he's not punishing Prigozhin. He's still in St. Petersburg. He spent most of uh, that month in St. Petersburg. He was even allowed to come to Moscow to meet with, with Putin personally. Is he, as far as we know, he's still in St. Petersburg? Yes, we, we, uh, it was revealed um, just it, it has just been confirmed that he was attending the the summit the russia africa summit in st petersburg the subtitle of your book um gets at a very interesting question that a lot of people have i mean everybody from henry kissinger to europeans say they thought putin was rational he was calculating he was incremental and they did not as a result predict or think that he would declare war in february when he did what, why did he make that decision? Uh, you know, Putin is not as rational as uh, some people in the West believe. He is he's very irrational, and most of his de decisions are deeply rooted in, in his psychology, in his youth, in, 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 how, in, in the people he, uh, he used to talk to uh, many years ago. It's, um, I describe it in my book that uh, most of his prejudice for, uh, against Ukrainian nationalists uh, is just because of his uh, his favorite novel he, re he he was reading when he was a young student. That was a detective story about uh, Soviet spy Stirlitz who was fighting against Ukrainian nationalists. So it's it's really it's really very weird how how Putin perceives. Uh, uh, Russian history, uh, but at the same time, he is a part of his um, generation, and he is the the part of Russian traditional uh, historical narrative. Imperialist historical narrative existed in Russia. That's unfortunately the only the only version of history we have always had. And uh, I, with, with this book, I'm trying to to debunk uh, the Russian historical mythology because it's uh, it's probably the most dangerous part of Russian propagandist narrative, because Putin will go, but for many people, all those myths would remain the same. One of the things that people say is that uh, Putin has always had, as you say, this kind of ultra-Russian nationalist narrative. Then COVID happens. He stops meeting with anybody, foreigners. He, he gets more and more isolated. He restricts him to himself to a circle of real uh, kind of acolytes and courtiers. You have to you had to um, quarantine for two weeks before you could even mm -hmm. see him. And so maybe that also explains that he really got into a kind of hot house of just these these highly absolutely. nationalist Russians. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's uh, it's weird that during the, the COVID months, he uh, has become even more obsessed with history than, than, than before. Because uh, after that, he started writing articles about the uh, history of Poland, history of Ukraine, and he's always lecturing Russians about, uh, about history. But it's, it's all false. It's all a uh, falsified version of, of Russian history. He has created some kind of imaginary empire, and he's trying to impose that, um, that, that point of view. And actually, it, it works for, for so many people who are, who are not, um, not 
not major. I don't think that it works for majority of Russians, but but ma- ma- many people buy it. There was an anecdote in the FT that uh, Sergei Lavrov, the longtime foreign minister, who apparently was told about the invasion only two hours before, mm-hmm. uh, was asked, "Who is advising Vladimir Putin?" And he said, "Oh, I can tell you. He has three main advisors: Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, and Ivan the Terrible." <laughs> So it's to your Stalin, point about Stalin. history. Yeah. The fourth one, an important one, is it's Stalin. Stalin. Yeah, definitely. Interesting. Um, at the end of the day, do you think um, his days are numbered in any meaningful sense? You know, actually, uh, the sources in Moscow, I believe, right after Prigozhin's mutiny, started telling me that uh, they used to be sure that uh, his situation is very stable and he is there, he might be there for years to come, but now they think that probably one year at least, because uh, the situation is, uh, the, the system is, is shaking. Uh, many people from, from his elite understand that he is, uh, he's not there and they have to prepare um, for Russia after Putin. And at the same time, you know, and he thinks that he, he underestimates all the the difficulties of his situation, and he thinks that that the time is on his side because he's waiting for American elections. He he's waiting for Donald Trump to be back, and he's sure that once Donald Trump Trump is back in the White House, he's going to be fine. The, there's going to be no war, no resistance from Ukrainian side, no support for Ukraine. He'll kind uh, of deal with Trump. Yeah, and that that's the ideal happy end for for President Putin. Mikhail, pleasure to have you on and best of luck. Your your reporting has been fantastic. Thank you. Next on GPS, two prominent public officials, two powerful nations, two disappearances. What can we learn from these troubling events, one in Russia, one in China? That story when we come back.